Howdy friends, Brian Fleshig of Mad River Outfitters of the Midwest Fly Fishing Schools. And here we are, the episode we've all been waiting for, episode 14, and we're gonna cover the basics of fly casting. Now what we're gonna do today is give you the basic fundamentals, a good foundation to start from. But be sure to stay tuned because we're gonna be doing a whole series on intermediate and advanced casting techniques that you're surely gonna to wanna to tune into. But today, let's get you out there. You've got your equipment together, you've got the right leader selected, uh, so you know about the stuff. Now, let's get you out there and get you fly casting. Fly casting is really, really super easy, but the problem is, is it's counterintuitive. And thankfully, that's what's kept me employed for the past 30 years. But your intuition tells you that you want to throw something. You're probably not really accustomed to using a flexible lever like the rod. So your intuition is to throw something, okay? And fly casting is, like I said, it's really, really simple. Um, some great analogies that we like to use Fly casting is basically the same thing as throwing darts. If you've ever thrown a dart before, you're a pretty good fly caster. And if you can translate that same movement and that same wrist snap and stop, you're gonna be a good fly caster. Uh, did you ever make a paper airplane when you were growing up and throw that paper airplane? Fly casting is exactly the same thing. It's a nice, easy touch, and it's going to go out there just like butter. But if you try to throw that paper airplane hard, what happens? It crashes and burns at your feet. Fly casting is exactly the same thing as hammering a nail. And you're hammering that nail in the wall at about eye level. Say you're looking to hang a picture, okay? You've got the, the uh, just like the, the hammer in your hand here, and the tip of your fly rod is just like the head of the hammer. And you're gonna stop here, making sure that you hit that nail on the head. If you do too big of a stroke, if you hit the nail, you're gonna bend the nail, and chances are you're not even gonna hit the nail, you're gonna put a hole in the wall about six, eight inches below the nail. You've gotta hit that nail on the head. Thumb has to be forward, which we're about to talk about. Another great analogy is to take a, a paintbrush and dip it in a can of paint and you're going to try to fling paint on a wall, okay? And the fly rod is your paintbrush and you're going to fling that paint off the tip of your fly rod. Fling that paint. If you make a really big stroke like most people try to do with the fly rod, you're going to get paint on the ceiling, you're going to get paint on the wall and on the floor. You're trying to just get a little spot of paint on the wall, okay? And you're gonna find as we go through this that that same wrist snap, the same flinging of the paint, it's the same traveling up as it is coming down. The snap of the wrist, or we're gonna to refer to it at some point here as kind of a microsecond wrist snap, it's really not much more than opening a screen door. It's really that easy, friends. I often tell my students in classes uh, that I might be the first teacher that ever tells you I don't want to see any effort. As soon as you start trying, and as soon as you try to put a bunch of muscle into it and throw this hard, you're going to fail at fly casting. I need you to be a D minus or F plus student. As little effort as you can put into it, let the rod do the work for you. It's really, really simple. You see, I'm not moving much at all right here, and I'm making a fly cast. So, Let's go down to the water and take a look at some of the basics of getting started in fly casting. Okay, so the first thing is your stance. And you want to stand uh, a little bit sideways with your opposite foot forward, just as if you were throwing a dart or a baseball or a softball. You're going to have that opposite foot forward, in my case, my left foot. This is a much more natural stance. Uh, 
it's a much more stable stance. If you're, uh, if you're in a stream, it's gonna be safer. If you're on the nose of a boat, it's gonna be a lot safer. And the main thing it does for me fly casting, it allows me to turn at my torso and allows me to watch my upcast. Okay, especially as a beginner, if I can get you to turn and look at that upcast, I'll tell you what you're looking for and you'll be able to correct uh, some common mistakes. You grip a fly rod like you're shaking someone's hand. Your thumb goes right on top of the cork grip, just like you're reaching out to shake someone's hand. The thumb goes on top of the cork grip and the thumb should go as close to the cork, the end of the cork grip as possible. I see a lot of people that are holding the, the back here. I've even heard people say that the grip is designed that way so your hand fits, and that's not true. Move your thumb as close to the end of the court grip as possible. If any of you ever played a, a Little League Baseball or softball, you know that choking up on the bat gives you higher bat speed. I said I had two strikes. He goes, exactly. What do you do different? I said I choke up with two strikes. Best hitter in baseball does it from the beginning, Barry mm -hmm. Bonds. I was like, pretty much you know where the bat head is mm -hmm. all the time. You have more control. You have more coverage, actually, because now you can really extend mm -hmm. and everything. After that, my career changed. Mm -hmm. In our case, it's going to give you higher tip speed, and you're going to have more control over where the tip of the fly rod goes. Okay? So you've got your stance, and you've got your grip, thumb on top. <clears throat> rule number one, rule number one is that the rod tip and therefore the line, the leader, and the fly are going to go exactly where your thumb points them, okay? The rod doesn't have a mind of its own. It's going to go where your thumb points it, okay? If I point it straight down, it's going to go straight down and collapse on the water. If I point it straight out, hint, hint it's gonna go straight out. If I point it straight up in the air, boom, where my fly wound up, I can draw a perfectly straight line between the direction my thumb was traveling and where the fly wound up. It's simple, simple geometry. It goes exactly where your thumb points it, okay? This is most important. I mean, of course it's important on, on the downstroke, but this is most important on what we call the upcast, okay? You'll notice that I call it an upcast, or I should say we here at the Midwest Fly Fishing Schools call it an upcast and a downcast. And this is very, very important, okay? Your upcast, it should act like an airplane taking off a runway, and your downcast should act like an airplane coming in for a landing. Don't think of this as a back cast and a front cast like you hear elsewhere. It's really gonna help you if you think in terms of upcast and downcast. And in order for it to be an upcast, your thumb has to go up. Your thumb is going to travel this direction when it stops. That's going to launch it off the rod tip, just like an airplane taking off a runway. You know, I really can't stress enough the concept of the upcast and the downcast. And a couple of things that I think will really help you understand this is let's, let's really think about this. This part and this part, they both can't be down, right? You can't go down and down. That makes no sense and you're gonna have a big fat loop. Obviously, they both can't be up and up. That makes no sense as we've talked about the fish are down here. So, I mean, it's one of Newton's basic laws of physics. What goes up must come down. If you think of this in terms of an upcast and a downcast, even if you're casting sidearm down here at the side, even if you're casting sidearm, you'll see, still see that it's an upcast and a downcast. Another way to think of this is make sure that as that line is unrolling behind you, that there's an obtuse angle off the tip of the rod as that line travels up. You're gonna have an obtuse angle off the tip of the rod if it's a right angle or an acute angle that's a downcast you're making a bad cast okay we'll come back to that but just remember rule number one is that the rod tip therefore the line leader and the fly go exactly where your thumb points them we want them to be pointed up and we want to be angled downward 
coming in for a landing, okay? So rule number two is that you must start and for that matter end every fly cast you ever make with your rod tip below your belt, okay? If you're casting in the grass in your backyard, in a field, what have you, put your rod tip on the ground. If you're casting in a, a piece of body of water like this, put your rod tip at the water level. Rod tip has to be down low. And the reason for this is a lot of people, a lot of people want to start here. It's a very common problem. In fact, I asked Lefty Cray one time, I said, Lefty, what's the number one mistake people make? They said they want to, he said they want to start here. You want to start with that rod tip as low as possible, okay? If you start here, you're already halfway through the stroke. You're only making half a cast. If you're asking an airplane pilot to take off a runway, which you are, you're asking him to use only half the runway if you're right here. So start with the rod tip low, below your belt, put it in the water or on the ground, okay? So step number one is that we must get the line moving. We must get it moving in the direction that we want it to go, okay? And we're gonna call that, let's say, if we're looking at a clock face going around us like this, let's say from seven o'clock on that clock face to about 10 o'clock on that clock face is where I get the end of the line moving, okay? Let me get this out there. From approximately seven to approximately 10, get it moving. And then from approximately 10 o'clock to approximately one o'clock, 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock, I'm going to accelerate and stop the rod. I get that line moving. I get the rod tip traveling in a straight line, albeit a diagonal line between 10 o'clock and 1 o'clock. You want to be sure that you stop that rod right here at 1 and don't go a bit further, okay? Okay, so you've heard this before. Maybe you've seen uh, this on YouTube somewhere or taken a casting class, and they talk about 10 to 2. Okay, and 10 to 2 is unfortunately really wrong. Or worse yet, they tell you to scrape the ceiling with your rod tip. Well, they're right in the fact that the rod tip is traveling in a straight line, and that's very important. But if you look at a straight line between 10 and 2, that's parallel to the ground. Of course, a ceiling is parallel to the ground. You don't ever want to make a parallel fly cast, friends. That makes no sense. You'd be launching that forward cast some 15 to 18 foot above the water level. I guess it's good if you're fishing for parrots or for monkeys in the trees, but if you change it from 10 to one and draw that straight line with the rod tip, now your cast is angling up. You're progressively loading your fly rod. Trust me, your fly rod's gonna work a lot better and you're casting down like an airplane coming in for a landing and you're casting to where the fish are. Not to mention, you're slicing through the wind better and gravity's helping you out. So <clears throat> we've changed that straight line 10 to two to a straight line 10 to one. I actually had a guy argue with me about this and he told me that, a, that 10 to one wasn't a straight line. Really, 10 to one is a straight line. I'll draw it on the board for you. Okay, so draw a straight line with that rod tip, and just before you get to one o'clock, here's where you're gonna make that little wrist snap. You're gonna throw the dart, throw the paper airplane, fling the paint, hammer the nail, all of those analogies that we drew, it happens right before one o'clock there. So the good news is the downcast is exactly the same thing in the opposite direction. 50% happens here, 50% happens here. It's exactly the same thing and it has to be, okay? So you're gonna speed up and stop just before one o'clock here, and then you're gonna drag it right down that straight line path from one o'clock to back to 10 o'clock, and you're gonna fling the paint, you're gonna hammer the nail, throw the dart, whatever works for you, and stop that rod at 10 o'clock above eye level. <clears throat> that brings the, that brings it, down like an airplane coming in for a landing you fling the paint fling the paint lower the rod down to fishing position 10 to 1 friends not 10 to 2 if the fish actually are up there 15 or 18 foot 
above you, you got bigger problems than worrying about your fly casting. The fish are always going to be below your belt, I guarantee you that, and cast down to where they are. Up cast, down cast. Okay? So I get it moving, and from approximately 10 to 1, I speed up and stop, I speed up and stop, and I lower the rod down to fishing position. If you look on a clock face, 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock is a 90 degree angle, okay? And essentially, <clears throat> your elbow is the tip of a right triangle, and your rod tip is making the base of that triangle. Yes, it's an upside down triangle, but you'll be able to see this here. My elbow is the tip of the triangle. You make the base of the triangle with your rod tip and straight line path, and you stop here. Make sure you don't go past one o'clock, you don't go past 10 o'clock, and make that rod tip travel in a straight line. But whatever you do, do not move the fulcrum point, and that's your elbow. That elbow must stay stationary. Elbow must stay stationary, boom. Get it moving, fling your paint, get it moving, fling your paint, and then lower down to fishing position. I think it's important also to interject uh, a, a mention of your wrist, okay? And um, you'll hear a lot of casting instructors that say don't break your wrist. And I'm not gonna go that extreme, and when you tune in for some of our more intermediate and advanced stuff, I'm gonna tell you to break your wrist, but there's a time to do it and a time not to do it. And during that 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock speed stroke, there is a snap of the wrist right at the end of the stroke. You snap the rod to a stop. You snap the rod to a stop. And that does involve a short, quick snap of the wrist. I think Doug Swisher once called it a microsecond wrist. The secret to casting is educating your wrist. Doug Swisher will show you how. Which is controlled by what I call the microsecond wrist. Again, just like you're hammering a nail or flinging paint. The one thing you do want to avoid, though, is keeping your arm stationary like this, not drawing that 90 degree right triangle with your forearm, and keeping your forearm straight and bending your wrist like this. That's a no-no. You don't want to do that. Not to mention, when you do that, the rod is coming way past 1 o'clock. It's going way past 10. You're making this big fat triangle, I don't even know what kind of triangle that is you're making. You want it to be a right triangle and your arm here is one leg of that triangle. When you stop here it's the other leg of that triangle. Your elbow is the tip of the triangle, albeit upside down, and your rod tip is drawing the base of the triangle. And again, the straighter line you keep that rod tip the tighter your loops will be and the more it's going to sail out there for you. In fact, as little body movement as possible altogether. If you move your body at all, rotate your body, you're detracting from tip speed. If you move the fulcrum point of this rod, you're slowing down the tip of the rod and that's not good. It's all about making the tip go fast. When you're doing this, remember that the tip must bend. You must bend the tip by getting it loaded and then flinging the paint. Get it loaded, hammer the nail. Get it loaded, throw the paper airplane. Okay, there's two other things <clears throat> that we need to talk about. And the first is your loop, the candy cane shaped loop that you'll see that forms when I stop the tip of the rod, okay? The loop is an indicator of a good cast. A tight loop or one that's close to itself is energy efficient, it's wind resistant, shortest distance between two points is a straight line, and a tight loop is a straighter line than a big fat loop. Here's big fat loops. That's bad. That's going to wind up hitting the ground behind you, and it's going to wind up in a big mess in front of you, okay? So what makes a tight loop? Okay, I'm going to explain it to you two ways. If my rod tip is traveling between 10 and 1, I get it moving, make it travel in a straight line path between 10 and 1, and then I stop the tip at 1. The distance that your thumb travels off of that straight line between 10 and 1, the distance that your thumb travels is exactly how big your loop will be. If you go bam and stop, there's the size of your loop. If you go bam and stop, there's the size of your loop. 
Another way to think of this is for every degree that you go past 90 degrees, 10 to 1 is 90 degrees, for every degree that you go past 90 degrees, your loop opens up, gets fatter, and you're, you're losing and wasting energy, okay? And then last but not least, timing. Fly casting is rhythmic. There's a, a timing to it just like music. And essentially, you need to wait for that line to straighten out almost completely behind you before you begin the process of dragging that line forward to execute the wrist snap to get it out in front of you. If you wait too long, which most people don't wait too long, they're excited to get to this part, so they don't wait long enough. But if you did wait too long, what's going to happen is the energy goes through the system, goes through the line, through the leader, through the fly, and it goes out the rear end of the fly, and it's gone. You should be able to see in my rod tip that the rod is loaded, and then the instant it goes perfectly straight, my rod relaxes. It unloads. You need to begin to bring that rod forward while that rod is still loaded, while there's still kinetic energy in the rod. If the energy leaves the system, in other words, if the line goes perfectly straight behind you, the rod unloads, it's game over, okay? If you come forward too soon, which is more likely what you're gonna do, that's what most people do is come forward too soon, you're gonna hear a snap, crackle, or popping sound behind you. And as a retailer of fishing flies, I love that sound because every time you do it, you're snapping off a $2 or a $4 fly. If you hear that snap, crackle, or pop, you're not allowing the line to, to straighten out enough. You're not, you're coming forward too soon and you're just like you're cracking a, a bull whip, okay? So <clears throat> just to review, and then we're gonna have you lay out 25 or 30 feet of line. I'm gonna have you put your line under your index finger and you're we're gonna work on your basic casting stroke, okay? So you've got your stance, you've got your thumb on top of the rod, you've got your rod tip below your belt. You get the end of the line moving, and then from 10 to one, you draw a straight line, straight line back to 10 and lower the rod. And just before you get to one, you're gonna snap your wrist, you're gonna fling paint, throw a dart, throw a paper airplane, hammer a nail, whatever analogy works for you, bam, and stop that rod. You're gonna drag it forward and you're gonna go bam and stop that rod at approximately the 10 o'clock position above eye level and then you're gonna lower the rod, making sure that it travels up, okay? When you're practicing fly casting, you always wanna look behind you. You're really gonna fix some of these common mistakes in no time. Not to mention one of the complaints of beginning fly anglers is they always wind up with their flies in the trees. Well, by looking behind you, you can pretty much prevent that. But the three things that you're looking for is you're looking to make sure that that line is traveling up. Make sure it does not at any time fall below the plane of the rod tip. If that line is coming below the plane of the rod tip, you're throwing it that direction, you're losing energy, your rod is not loading as effective as it could. The second thing you're looking for is the size of your loops. You want these the, as tight a loops as possible, okay? You're looking up there to look at the size of your loops as well as coming forward. If your loop is too big, what are you doing? You're going further than 90 degrees with the rod and or that rod tip is coming off of that straight line, which is the base of the upside down right triangle. And the third thing that you're looking for is you're looking for the line to straighten out almost completely before you begin the process of the airplane coming in for a landing and then you're gonna fling the paint at 10 o'clock and you're gonna lower it. So you're looking to make sure it goes up, you're looking for the size of your loops, and you're looking to help with your timing, okay? So get out there, lay out about 25, 30 foot of line, put the line under your index finger for now, okay? In just a few minutes, we'll get back together and we'll talk about shooting line, which will incorporate this hand. But let's make some basic fly casts Make sure it goes up, comes down to where the fish are, nice tight loops, and uh, straightens out almost completely before you begin the process of coming forward. Okay, you've got your basic stroke down. 
Now let's start to talk about fishing. Now you're gonna take the line out from under your index finger and you're gonna pinch it between your thumb and your index finger of your opposite hand, okay? If you hold tight to that line during the entire stroke, it's the same as having it under your index finger. You're casting a set amount of line, no lines going out, okay? When you start fishing, the most important thing I can teach it is that once that cast hits the water, put the line under your index finger. I don't care if you have to stand in your backyard and practice that a thousand times. Every time that fly line hits the water, put the line under your index finger. Now, you're gonna strip, let's say you're fishing a bait fish, a minnow imitation, you're gonna swim that bait fish by stripping from behind your index finger. Don't reach up here, strip from behind your index finger, okay? That, having the line under your index finger is the crux of your control system, so that when a fish hits, boom, that's, that's where the tension comes from that I set the hook, okay? So let's say I'm stripping, stripping, stripping. Now I'm gonna take the line out from under my index finger, and I'm gonna, let's say I wanna go five foot further. I'm gonna do what's called shoot the fly line, okay? Let me show you again, I'm gonna, or I'm fishing a popper on a pond like this. Pop, 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 pop. Now I wanna go back out to that same spot or five foot further, I shoot the line, line goes under the index finger and I'm ready to fish, okay? Friends, shooting fly line, I need you to pay very close attention, but shooting fly line, all you do is you let go of the line. It couldn't be easier. If you've got a good upcast and you've got a nice tight loop, in other words, that rod tip is traveling in a straight line path, it's going to be as easy as slicing hot butter. Hot butter. All you do is let go, but you've got to let go at just the right time. You let go only after you have stopped the rod tip at that 10 o'clock position. So I go stop, stop, and then and only then can I let go. You're going to do two things when you first try this. The first thing that's gonna happen, I guarantee, is you're gonna let go too soon. You're gonna let go here, and the line is gonna come up and slap you in the arm. It's gonna fall on a big pile, and it's not gonna go anywhere. You'll hear it slip, you'll feel it slip. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about, and you know that you need to let go only after you've stopped, and then you can let go, okay? The second thing that you'll do is this, is um, you might start making a few false casts and false casts are where you keep the line up and in the air. It can help you add some distance, but really false casting is really only good when you're trying to dry a dry fly that's been wet, saturated, and you're trying to dry it off, or even a popping bug or something here on a bass pond. You dry it off and then make your presentation. But let's say that you're making a couple of false casts, right? You've got the line in your left hand, and now you say, oh crap, I gotta shoot this line, you're gonna go like this. And you're gonna try to throw it. As an experiment, go in your bathroom and take a cotton ball and try to throw it really hard across the room. It's not gonna go anywhere. Of course, you remember making a paper airplane as a kid. Imagine throwing that paper airplane hard, what's gonna happen? It's gonna crash and burn at your feet just like my fly line just did. Don't change a thing. Don't do anything different. Just let go of the fly line when you stop right here. You don't have to put any extra oomph into it. You don't want to be throwing. Lefty Cray used to say that people looked like they were going to tear their underwear when they were trying to shoot fly line. And you, you don't change a thing, friends. Just let go of the fly line. Again, if you've got a good upcast, and a good downcast and you're utilizing the load and the rod to its greatest potential and you're utilizing gravity to its greatest potential and the rod tip is traveling in a straight line. In other words, you have a nice tight loop. All you're going to have to do is let go of the line and it's like slicing hot butter. Now I don't just let go of the line willy-nilly because it's likely to wrap around my reel. Um, I'll kind of cup the line. You'll see I kind of cup the fly line like this. 
your, your hand almost becomes an additional stripping guide and it helps feed it through and then also you've got the line in your hand and you're poised and ready to get that line under the index finger by the time that it hits okay so shooting fly line is something that you should start to practice it's going to help you out a lot and it's as simple as letting go but you have to let go only after you've stopped only after you've flung the paint off the paintbrush after you've hammered the nail Hammer the nail, let go of the fly line. It's that simple. One last thing that we'll talk about here is a cast called the roll cast. And a roll cast is a really cool tool to have in your kit bag. And a roll cast is done um, when you can't make an upcast. Let's say there's a row of trees or a brick wall right behind you and you can't physically make an upcast. Well, a roll cast is done by leaving the line on the water very important that you leave the line on the water bring the rod back to that one o'clock stopping position and when the line crosses the plane of the rod it'll kind of form this what we call a d loop i bring it back lines on the surface the flies out there in the water and now all you do friends it could be easier you make a down cast you take it from one to ten and stop the rod and it's going to roll it right out there again drag it back roll it from 10, or excuse me, from one back to 10, stop the rod tip above eye level as you normally would, and again, just like slicing hot butter, this will roll right out there for you. It's a really neat cast to have in your arsenal. Now, you're gonna see a lot of people that tell you to bring it back to here and stop it, and then slam it down to nine o'clock. Well, I don't need to tell you how wrong that is and how it's going to just you know do that same thing with the paper airplane and see what happens it's going to crash and burn right there in a big pile on the water it's no different than your downstroke than your forward cast okay take it from one o'clock stop the rod let the line come to a rest boom back to ten o'clock and then lower the rod to fishing position okay so as always thanks for watching Remember to stay tuned. We're going to do a full-blown uh, series on fly casting where we'll get into some more in intermediate and advanced techniques. But uh, get out there and practice. You've got to practice this. Absolutely can't stress that enough. Um, you're going to have to put in some hours of practicing your fly casting. Uh, again, stay tuned. Part of what we do moving forward will be diagnosing some common casting problems. But remember, start low. Thumb should be towards the end of the court grip. Get the end of the line moving. And then from 10 to 1, then 1 to 10. 10 to 1, 1 to 10. Make sure that line travels up and that you have an obtuse angle off the rod tip at all times and make sure it angles down towards the water. Make sure you've got a nice tight loop and remember what makes that nice tight loop is keeping that rod tip traveling in a straight line path or keeping that angle as close to 90 degrees as you can for your speed stroke. Let the line straighten out almost completely behind you. If it falls, you lose energy. If you hear that snap, crackle, pop behind you and you're snapping off flies, you know you're coming forward too soon. So thanks for watching as always. Be sure to subscribe and stay tuned. We got a lot more coming at you.